Studio. I'm Judy McKenzie and I'm here with Wanda Mom. And we have been painting plein air, outdoor landscape painting for years. And we really want to share how easy it is once you know the nuts and bolts and how to get out and paint outside with confidence. So what we're going to do today is go over a few of those great tips and tools to paint out on location. So let's take a look here at what we're going to be covering for you. This first segment that we're doing is going to be on materials because a lot of people may have painted in the studio for years but really don't have any idea what they need to take to be able to go outside. So we're going to talk about things like portability, weight, what are the things that you absolutely need as well as some of the other items that don't have anything to do with the paint that you may want to take outside with you. So let's take a look here at what we're going to be covering first thing. So we're going to talk about easels and there's lots of types of easels and they have advantages and disadvantages both. So maybe something that we show you will help you make a decision as to what you might want to get out to. We'll talk about brushes for the field as, long as, pa as well as palette knives and then canvases and palettes and then thinners and paint and solvents. And then we have some visual aids that definitely help you when you go out to the field. I'll never forget my very first time plein air painting. I hardly had any of these and had a very difficult time. So our goal is to be able to kind of shortcut some things for you and give you the tips that you might need to get outside and get to painting in the field. So we're going to do also the materials list and hope you'll then join us for our painting progression. So it'll help you get out in the field once you know all of the materials and the tools. So our second segment then will cover the actual process of going outside to paint and kind of give you a methodology to follow that's going to help you be able to start a painting all the way through to finishing that painting. Okay, so let's, let's start here and talk about our easel types. So we've got several types of easels to show you and like I said each has advantages and disadvantages. So you have to decide what are the most important elements for you. And we may talk about some things that you didn't even consider when looking for an easel to take outside. Mm -hmm. Let's take a look at the, the tried and true French easel first. So this is what the impressionists used to use, a little revised here. Pretty heavy when it's all put together, but it is all one piece. You can put your paints, your brushes, all your supplies in the box. So people really like that, but it also added a lot of weight. Uh, disadvantages, sometimes the, the legs get warped, they swell a little bit, and it's not as stable on, on rough ground. Uh, comes in this size, and you can also buy the um, a half, French. half French easel which I love and still use. So it's really nice to have in the, in the car. Uh, some people use this easel, which you need to keep in the box, uh, a palette, I'm sorry. And then some people like just using a box that they can bungee cord onto it and then take their paints off and take that home. Um, another one that's a small lap one, and there are several that you can take travel. I've taken this to Europe uh, and it just, folds up and goes in the backpack and this is really nice and this is I think the Gorilla Box paint box. So as you can see portability is something you have to take into consideration. If you're going to be a hiker and hike into a location you don't want a lot of weight involved in what you're doing. You also don't want it to be cumbersome and awkward so you have to give considerations. Jeannie and I each have several plein air setups and depending on the situation, we may change to a slightly different easel, knowing what we're going to be doing when we get to a location. Um, as, as you get it into a little bit lighter box, this is more your Peshad box. So um, this is our microphone down below, the red, that is not part of the Peshad, but you're using a camera tripod. The setup is the same, it's on a ball head and on an um, attachment uh, to the tripod so that you can move it around. Um, this one in particular is um, an open box M and what's nice about it is that you can get it away from the sun. 
So it opens up completely as opposed to the French easel. So when you want to paint in the shade, um, this works well because you have a lot of different angles to it. So I use these quite a bit. Um, another one is Artwork Essentials, which is basically the same type, a little heavier, but it goes in a backpack very easily. Both of these do, but where do you put your paints, your tripods, your brushes? On the French easel, they went in the box. With the Pichon boxes, you have to have a whole separate bag for all your other goodies that you need for painting. So you, it doesn't make it that much lighter, and the tripods are often heavier than these little legs. So it's a little bit of a balance on how to organize your supplies. So knowing all of these things, when it came to finding a plein air easel, uh, myself being an artist and my husband being an engineer, we actually designed a box that was portable, lightweight, and could go into a backpack so that I could put almost everything on my back and carry the easel with me. So this is what it looks like, just the pallet box itself. The handle is the mast, and then inside is where you can mix your paints. And we have a little brush carrier. And this is so light. Um, it is not heavy like some of the fish rod boxes. And you have a little bit of weight with the tripod. So what it looks like set up is over here. And this was the handle. This is the box itself. Something that I added then later was a gorilla box to put the paints in. And the advantage to doing this is in the evening, if I'm going to go into you know my room or accommodations for the night, I can maybe touch up a painting or work on something a little bit without taking the whole box in. I'll just open it up and pull this out. So that was a nice advantage. Um, it's very lightweight, and this just sits on a photography tripod. So we like this. Um, the whole thing probably weighs eight to 10 pounds. And um, it's, it's very nice to take in the field. I also use an umbrella, and we'll be talking about an umbrella in a little while. But this is about everything I need, and then I have some brushes and paint. Mm -hmm. Great. Let's take a look at what else we take when we go on our outing. Uh, Want to make sure you have a sketch pad, like canvas carrier. How do you get that wet paint back? Some people will put it in a little uh, pizza box. Those work well. Very economical. Put them in the back of your car. Nothing gets set on it. Uh, they also have um, panel carriers and we'll go over some of those supplies in a little bit. Uh, your bug spray, water, paper towels, trash bags, umbrella, wet wipes, um, ways to get the paint out of your clothes, and your gloves and hats. Hat. I like to use gloves in the field. I tend to be a little messy. So I have these cotton painting gloves, and uh, these are really nice. A pair of lightweight garden gloves can do the same, and some people choose to use rubber gloves. So you have to give consideration as to how you work, if you mind the feel of paint on you, and then you always want to take things that you're comfortable. Good, comfortable pair of shoes is absolutely paramount. Flip-flops and sandals and things are really not advisable going out in the field because you're often standing in tall grasses, you're standing on rocks, you might even be down near a stream. So you want to have comfortable shoes, sturdy shoes that you can have on for several hours, walking in, walking out, and all of those types of things. And invariably you're standing on the anthill. So you always have to keep that in mind that things are going to be coming and nibbling on your ankles too. So protection and footwear is great. So I pack most of my stuff in a backpack and you want to choose a backpack that has the ability to put your box in if that's you know what you're going to be doing is putting that in there and then all your bug spray and your brushes and your paint thinner and all those types of things that you take out there with you. You want to be as portable as possible, as lightweight as possible. So wet wipes would also be a good idea. Um, in our early years, wet wipes didn't even exist, so we would have to take something along. Sometimes I put soap on a paper towel and slip it into a Ziploc bag and take with me. But something to kind of clean yourself up. Oil paint uh, can be a messy medium, and once it's on your hands, it travels. It can get on the inside of your car and on your clothes and everything else. So I do like to clean my hands off before I kind of head out. 
afterwards. And one thing we'll also go over is how do you uh, transport your solvents. We'll show you some of the different containers that you can bring. Um, that's another way that you want to make sure it's sealable and it's not going to end up in your car and in your backpack. Um, so. so wind is always a consideration when you're going out and so you've got your setup and you want to figure out if it's fairly stable. Invariably, when you're painting in the field, there's going to be something that happens. I mean, whether the wind comes up and knocks everything over, or ants come by, or, or bears, or anything else. So you always have to take into consideration different types of scenarios that you may run across so you can kind of plan for them. One thing I do, this easel is fairly stable that my husband and I have designed. But if it's really windy out, I'll bring along an extra little bag and I'll go find some rocks and tie it around on it and just kind of hang it down. And it's fairly stable then. So stability is important, weight is important, and those scenarios that come up. And also, uh, a trash bag for your paper towels. So one way, it always acts, acts as a spinnaker when you're out there and painting. So putting a couple rocks in the bottom of your trash bag is great for keeping that bag from sailing away as well and taking your easel off with it. All right, so next up, we'll be actually looking in more detail at some of these items that we've been talking about, like the brushes and the canvases and those types of things. So we'll be back in a few seconds. Oh, oh hi, <laughs> welcome back. <laughs> uh, we'll take a break here. Good friends, you know. <laughs> um, so we were going through the materials, so we're gonna continue on with the materials now, and we're going to kind of break them down into little pieces so that each area we spend a little time discussing with you. So first of all, we're gonna talk about different types of brushes and palette knives. Then we're gonna go over canvases and different types of palettes, and we'll be covering things in this one like tone, not tone, different sizes, how do you decide which one of those you wanna take out. And we're going to talk about paints, thinners, and solvents, and then those helpful visual aids that will help you out in the field. So let's go back here now, and let's start out with brushes and palette knives. So it's very uh, common when someone isn't used to painting outside to go, what kind of brush do I take? You know, can I, can I take my watercolor brushes that I already have at home? And the answer would be no, you don't take beautiful, sable watercolor brushes out in the field. It's kind of tough on brushes out in the field because you may scrub into a canvas a little bit more, the brush may get dropped in the dirt, so you don't necessarily want to take your really expensive brushes out, but you want nice enough quality that they perform. So there's a couple different types of bristles, so let's talk about bristle types first. And, and also with watercolor, you don't want to use solvent on watercolor brushes, it's only water. So if you use solvent on a watercolor brush, it blocks the absorption of water. So it'll ruin a, a watercolor brush. So yeah, definitely. You want to keep oil brushes for oils. You might be able to cross over an acrylic, but you never cross over watercolor and oil by any means. So let's look at the bristles. So these are both bristle brushes. Now bristle brushes are designed to hold paint, to be able to scoop up paint, and then be able to put nice amounts of paint on the canvas. You can also thin your paint out quite thinly and still use a bristle brush. So those are good for that. Now if you go to a synthetic brush like the one Jeannie's holding here, mm -hmm. it is a soft bristle. If you brush it against your face, it feels soft, kind of like a makeup brush. Mm -hmm. Where if you brush a bristle brush against your face, you're going to tell that it's stiffer and a firmer type of bristle on the brush. So then when we look at these two brushes, you'll notice that one is curved and one is flat. So this is a flat and this is called a filbert. Now depending on your painting style or the style that you may develop as you figure out how to paint, filbert brushes leave less hard edges where a flat brush will leave that definite hard edge. When you make a stroke you're going to see that edge on each side. So you have to spend a little time figuring out which type of brush will be best for the way that you paint. Um, so different sizes, you're always going to want different sizes and then we may be have different lengths of brushes. Also another one uh, compared with the flat, you see the same long brushes, but you may see a flat or a bright. Bright has a more stubby uh, length, and uh, so it's more of a square, just as tall as it is wide, whereas the flat is about one and a half tall. More spring in this one. 
so you get a little more action in your brush. So look at the length of these bristles now. So these bristles are egg birds and they're very long and you can do some really interesting things with these where you can be drawing along a line or you can turn it and use the flat and with the bend you've got a tremendous amount of spring so you can get a trail off with your stroke when you make it. Mm -hmm. So considering you know different kinds of brushes even though these are all bristle brushes they all do a little bit different performance wise. So again, figuring out what type of brush works for what you're trying to do in your painting is time well spent. So I take a variety of brushes from small little brushes like this to this size or even a little bit bigger for painting in the field. And this would even be on a small canvas because a large brush always has the ability to be used on the edge of the shoulder of the brush, just the end of the brush, the whole brush, Larger brushes have a lot of different types of angles and different types of strokes that you can make with them. So I would, you know, maybe go from this, this is like a number four, and this one's a 10. And then I might choose to take like a number one round as well. So a few in between. I take a lot of brushes to the field, but I never use them all. I, I use a variety of ones. I'll pick out five, and that's about all I would use. And also, some people say, okay, I'm going to take a brush that is my green brush. One is my just my sky brush. And they don't mix their sky brush with their foreground dirt color. Because as soon as you get those oranges and browns in your sky, you start losing that clarity and that um, wonderful brightness. So you might want to think also, well, I'm going to keep this as just my very light sky. This is going to be my watercolor or my dirt or my very dark, darkest blue. Um, colors for brushes. Uh, this one is um, also whoops, a what they call a design brush. It's very skinny. It's about an inch or uh, half inch long. It's a great for twigs, uh, telephone poles, but also it's a great signing brush. So sometimes they call it a rigger brush. Sometimes it's called a design brush. So having one of these real thin ones is really nice. So let's go into knives and a couple of other tools here that you might uh, use. Knives come in different lengths, um, different bends in it. Some of them are stiff, some of them are very flexible. And so I myself like a brush with a lot of flex because I mix my colors with my knife, not my brush, because I like to keep my brushes as clean as possible. So I like to use a knife. And for me, if I use a knife, I make a bigger pile of paint. When I use a brush, I tend not to mix enough paint and it really gets pushed into the ferrule of the brush which is the bottom part of the brush. And I've always been ecology and ecologically minded and a, a bit of a tightwad if you want to use that term. Because if I get all that paint pushed down in the furl, it's much harder to clean. And sometimes in the field, you may not get the opportunity to totally clean the brush. So I like to use a knife for my mixing. So we have a variety of knives here. And these are not only for mixing your paint, but for painting with. And so you can draw, you know, lines, load the knife up and put it on the painting flat. You could load just the edge up by scraping into the paint and then drawing a paint line with just the edge of the palette knife. And then some other things that you can do is use Q-tips. These are makeup Q-tips and they are bound on the end and come to a nice point and this is also bound. So these are not regular Q-tips but makeup Q-tips and you have to go to the makeup section of stores to find them. You can erase areas. You know, if I put a color on, put a stroke of color and go, well, I don't like that. This will take it off very quickly and it won't leave any paint thinner or anything behind. I can draw fence posts, wires, lines, bird wings, all kinds of things with these little Q-tips. And then the other thing is called a silicone shaper. And these usually come in a set of four or five. And they were originally designed for sculpture. But painters have picked them up, figuring out that you can draw lines, you can actually scoop paint out of the way. From watercolors to oil painters um, can be seen using these. So they're called silicone shapers. Um, Amazon is a great place to get them. I often get them there. And then some artists will use something like just a putty knife to maybe smooth paint out, to draw lines, um, to just 
kind of go over the top with a, a little coat to skip and drag across the top of painting and stuff. So there's various tools that you can use that really weren't designed for oil painting. Mm -hmm. Another thing in landscape painting or plein air, if you go outside and all of a sudden you've got all of these brushes that have been loaded up with paint and you may not be able to get back to cleaning them real quickly, rinse them out and put a little Vaseline in them. That'll keep them soft. It's a petroleum base, just like your solvent is often. And so the next day when you're ready to paint, just swish them out. You've got your back to a nice paint and it keeps them, um, also keeps them pointed. So um, we can talk about the carriers too. Uh, you want a great way to um, uh, hold your brushes. And these are nice because they go into the backpack. Uh, they're just uh, bamboo holders with some sleeves in them. Great for traveling international or just on a plane because your brushes stay nice and secure. Uh, this one would be more for something that's going to be still upright. You don't want it to be upside down and squash your bristles. Um, but these are just, you can get them at hardware stores. Uh, you buy the tube, have it whatever length you want, and then you buy the cap separately. And so this is just a little one that pulls apart that would go over the bristles. The main thing with all the carriers is that you want to keep the bristles from being bent or squished up because if they stay that way for very long, the bristles kind of have a memory and they can be very difficult to get smoothed back out. So you want to make sure whatever carrier you choose to take your brushes in that the tops of these bristles do not get squished, bent, or put into a shape that is not going to work for you in painting. Um, I've had some students ruin their brushes because they brought them in a container where they were all bent. Paint does not come off of a bent bristle. It's very difficult. So then you've got to put them in hot water and shape them and do all that stuff to get them back in shape. So it is worth consideration to spend some time deciding on what you might want to take those brushes out to the field with. Well, let's look at um, canvases and uh, palettes. Uh, there are all sorts of different canvas papers, palette papers, uh, and also different support systems. Uh, you can buy them already mounted. The canvas paper, oh, that canvas paper here? is like these, and you can buy them by the roll, and then you can mount them on the boards. So sometimes I will even just tape them to a board, and then these go into a carrier, and it's really great to um, take them home that way. This one's a little six by eight on an eight by 10. Then when I'm done with this one, it's maybe a little dry back at the hotel, I have an extra canvas that I can use myself. And these are, you know, these canvas papers can be really nice. When Jeannie and I went to Europe together, we both just took this because it's not very heavy, it's very lightweight. We cut different sizes and put them together and just did a little roll of them and took them that way, rolled them around our little uh, brush holder here, like this, and it doesn't take up nearly as much space. I love using these, but if you're traveling on a plane for any distance, uh, they can have a fair amount of weight. What I've done with this one is, this was uh, another trip. I cut my canvases ahead of time, would mount them, and then in the hotel room or the area that we were painting in, I bring a little clothesline and close pins, and in your, of course, the hotels don't want you to put all this wet paint, but in the place that I was staying, I would string the clothesline and clip all my wet paintings, and people love to come in and just see what we had recently painted. And that way you're not worrying about uh, the fact that they are laying down somewhere. Um, even when they dry, and if you're using a solvent that dries quickly, like a Gams Hall, or, um, you can put them in, in the sleeves. Or put wax paper in between, stack the papers, and bring them home this way. This goes into a suitcase really well. And they kind of wonder why you're bringing clothes lines and clothes pins <laughs> on your international trip, but you like to stay clean. So the other thing to take into consideration with the canvases is the format size of the canvas. There are standards like 8x10, 9x12, and so forth. But 
I'm fond of odd sizes. Squares kind of give you a slightly contemporary look. And then we've got the real long rectangles. And they make a very dramatic painting. Um, so odd sizes, uh, for me, are, are more fun to work on than the standard mm -hmm. sizes. And you have to keep in mind that if you are using a, a plein air or a, a push hod box, um, that it goes to that size. Some of the, some of the boxes, maybe 12 by 16, is as big as they get. So. And you really don't want to take really large canvases out to the field because you really only have two to two and a half hours to get these paintings done. Mm -hmm. So you have to take into consideration how long it's going to take you to create a particular size. Mm -hmm. You can't be out there four hours. So really large canvases don't work very well unless you're an artist that likes huge brushes and can work with them. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we talk about whether you toned or don't tone a painting, and we'll go over that when we talk about our uh, more of the progression. But some people feel that they like to have a canvas that is more in line with what they're painting on or mixing colors on. This outside is very, very bright and get and now, but if you're mixing on a white palette paper, this might be just the ticket. So either way, but these are panels and then we have stretch canvas. These are real easy to find. A lot of palette knife painters use this because there's a lot of bounce, a lot of give. And if you use a palette knife, these work better than a panel. This is too hard for palette knife painters. So they like the stretch canvas. But the disadvantage of these outside, if you want to hold that yeah. one, and here's a panel. Look what happens when the sun gets behind them. Is that showing? So what you have on this side, the light's not showing through. On this side, you're fighting against the sun coming through your canvas. So you need to maybe put a newspaper behind it or a piece of cardboard uh, just to get rid of that back reflection. And why that is bad is with the light coming through the back, it gives you a false sense of lighting within your painting. And you will think, oh, wow, am I doing great. Look at how much light I've got in here. We had a student once who was working with a stretch canvas, so happy with what she'd done, brought it inside the building, and was very dismayed to find out that all that beautiful light she thought she was getting in her canvas wasn't there at all. It was completely flat and dead. So light coming through the back needs to be avoided. So you either block this off, or choose to do a panel that's more opaque. Mm -hmm. All righty, so we've got the wood. Sometimes you can, uh, like this one, is actually a piece of wood paneling that I varnished. So that's another way, very economical way to paint uh, on. Very easy to uh, come and, and some people like working on birch wood panels. They prefer working on the wood uh, as to one of the canvases that are mounted on the back or one of the masonite boards. And it's really just a matter of personal preference. Uh, but there are some companies that make these for painting outside. They're about the same thickness as a piece of masonite, but they're wood. They all have to have some kind of priming on them, though, no matter what you use. And you also have to be concerned about warping. Um, so this has, you know, little warp to it. You can always kind of use the frame to kind of flatten them out, but if they warp too much, sometimes they can be very difficult to frame. And part of it is, this was only varnished on one side, not varnished on the back side. So that's another reason that it did bow. So if you're going to varnish, make sure you do the gesso or varnish on both sides. That it helps the panels stay out. flatter. Okay, so um, let's talk a little bit more about palettes. That's a good so, idea. Um, why don't you talk about yours? All right, one? so this is a Gorilla palette, and I like this one because it fits in the box that my husband and I designed. And it's not anything special from any other palettes. It's just the size fits inside of my plein air box that I take out. It does have a little bit smaller mixing area, but I just clean it 
a little more often. And I like the cover on it because this cover pushes down on this and it keeps the paints hydrated for days and days and days. So this is the one that I use the most. And uh, palette paper is something you can use. This is a gray matters paper by Richardson Paint Company. And um, I line my box with this so that it's very easy to just flip it out when I want to change the paints and stuff. I think changing the paints and, and cleaning this off is a big consideration for a lot of people. Now be careful when you're using palette paper. Some people would just bring the palette paper and say, I'm gonna set it on my, uh, on my French easel and it's gonna look at, keep in mind you're dealing with wind. Yep. And unless you have some way of securing it and getting the back filled with paint, now where is it going to go? So you might want to think about one of this little Gorilla paper or putting it into one of these uh, plastic boxes. But again, it's got to be taped down. Or this has a piece of glass in it where you could put a, a um, plexiglass piece in it. You can use something like these clips to keep it in place. Mm -hmm. uh, that works. Um, you could even bungee this whole thing down to a board if that's what you wanted to use. Putting it you know, underneath the pallet box and keeping it in place that way. But just keep in mind that the paper on almost every occasion I've been outside will fly up and I saw one artist, the paper flew up, wrapped around his hand and he had every color wrapped all around his arm and his hand. It's very and colorful. Can you figure out how you're going to get this paint laden slab back into your car and back to your room or home. So think of maybe a pizza box again. And some of them are self-included. So this Peshad box, so Open Box M, has a um, built-in palette. Now, what I have here, I don't know if you can see the, the, the shininess of it. Oops, sorry. Uh, people say, oh, you have plexiglass in there. No, that is just um, linseed oil, solvent, oil paints that I have wiped off for years. And this is why you never want to leave paint on your palette, especially if it's in wood. So if you are finished painting for the day, you go, oh, I'll clean it up when I get back to the hotel room or back to home. We never do. We go to dinner, we go to sleep, we're tired, and that paint sits on there. So you lose that option of having this wonderful glass-like piece of wood that has been seasoned, just like a cast iron skillet. Let me show you one quick um, student palette that we found a while back that had fallen on the floor. She never cleaned it up. And so she's going to have to sand this whole thing down to eventually get back to having a nice workable palette because she's not sure which one is wet, which is the color she's working on. I do leave these on here. Uh, I don't clean those completely off because when you are traveling, sometimes this helps and adds as Velcro to help keep your paint spots. If it's completely smooth, it'll slide. As you can see, sometimes it does appear, but leaving a little bit of paint there helps to um, adhere the paint. Terrific. I think we'll spend some time talking now about paints. What you're going to take out the field for the actual painting process that you're going to do. So most people take the smaller tubes of paint that are about this size and then for colors that you use a lot of like white or ultramarine blue you might take the larger tube. Just the larger tube. What I do is, I, if I'm going out for one day, I might load up all my paints. Maybe I won't use maybe everything. I'll just do maybe five colors. And then the ones that I'm going to use, maybe blue and white, a lot of, I will put an extra tube in. That's great for one day for me. But if we're out for quite a while, uh, this is just a little makeup case, and that works great. 
So I can also do that with my, with the palette paper underneath. I can put out all my colors. I have my mixing area and I can clean that off, but leave the paints around the outside. So I kind of follow a similar process in that I put my paints out, put out extra of the largest, and then take a couple of the tubes of the paints that I use the most. So um, you have to decide, when you're going outside, let me back up, when you're in the studio, you can use maybe 20 paints or 30 paints. When you're outside, you have to think about limited color. Number one, you learn how to mix colors. Number two, you know the properties of your colors. Rather than reaching for this special chartreuse screen, what other colors can you use? Because you can see you don't have a lot of room on some of these plein air pieces. Like, um, you want a smaller pochette or a palette here. She's got to think about which colors she really wants to bring. So uh, limited palette, and then maybe some of your favorite convenience colors that you want to put in later uh, for maybe those little sparkles or that gray blue or that water that you want to make. Um, some of the, you paint in the Caribbean, you might take a different blue. So uh, start limited colors, learn how to really learn those properties, and then add colors as you get more comfortable with painting outside. Let's see, we've got uh, thinners, we've got solvents, mediums. So for most people are using a, it's a mineral, odorless mineral spirits is great. Um, and, and some people use um, something like walnut oil. Mm -hmm. And you can use poppy seed oil, or there's mm -hmm. different kinds of oils. Even the different manufacturers of paint companies sometimes don't all use linseed oil. Some of them may use walnut oil or poppy seed oil as well. So those things are, are good to take outside. Mm -hmm. And it, it kind of makes a difference whether you want to just have something to basically clean your brush and add just a little more fluidity to your paint, or you actually want a medium to make your paint more transparent, to make your paint dry quicker or to be able to blend colors together rather quickly those then may choose a medium and that might be like a liquid or a, a galkin uh, or i use the kinsler medium from richardson paint company mm -hmm. which is very similar to liquid mm -hmm. a little less toxic um so there are different options there and so you know if you're used to using a certain thing in the studio and you really like it there's no reason you can't take it to the field and these are more uh petroleum based whereas turpentine is a pine based sap based so the uh, this is great for cleaning your brushes but I use it as my medium so it's for thinning my colors as well just be careful not to overuse it more paint less mixing and some people use this kind of to thin their paint to the point that it will run down the canvas. Mm -hmm. If I'm going to do that, I'm probably going to choose something else because I don't want that much thinner in my paint mix. Mm -hmm. Generally, for adhesion reasons, you want less of the paint thinner in your paint mix. But if you're going to use mediums or something like that, you can take a small container like these little containers that are available in most art stores and um, almost any catalog has any, anything like this. They have a little lid. The only thing that's kind of difficult about them and I can't open it, <laughs> is that the lids can get themselves sealed on and then you can't reuse it. So you kind of want to keep those little threads wiped off and stuff, especially at the end of your day. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about containers that we might put that paint okay. thinner in. So uh, what I like to do is because I work on a Peshad box, I don't have a nice little TV tray or some side uh, table. Um, so everything has to hang on my easel here. So my brushes will go in a container here so that I'm hands-free. So all of those can go in the side. And then my turpentine container, you have to be able to, uh, or a mineral spirits container, has to completely seal. And you can buy extra rings for these when they start to wear out. But if this tips over, it's not gonna go anywhere. And um, I have then a little, um, just a S hook from a um, hardware store, and I just hang that on the side. So uh, now, when you are traveling internationally or traveling on the plane, I would still say don't bring any mineral spirits, even if they say safe for traveling. They're going to catch you one way or another. Uh, but once you get there, you can go to a hardware store or have some friends that get you the 
uh, mineral spirits. And then I carry a fuel bottle. And I take this in my backpack when I'm heading out into the field. And it's perfect for that extra little um, dab that you might need. So other than the metal containers, which is my preference because they seal up so well, um, people can bring uh, a plastic container like this with a little metal coil in it, or you can get some hardware cloth and bend it and push it into the bottom. You want a little something in the very bottom to kind of keep the paint solids below it that you can kind of gently rub your bristles back and forth to get that extra paint out of it. So a jar in itself um, is usable but you keep stirring up all of those paint solids and you end up with kind of this gray gunky stuff mm -hmm. that, you know, in your paint and stuff. And it can be very hard to keep it clean. Um, I like to have you know, my thinner a little cleaner on the top. So if I do want to include it in the paint, it doesn't have a tint of color or something else in it. So I've used these plastic jars before, but I've always inserted something in there to kind of run my brush back and forth. So the metal wire hardware cloth is very easy to cut and kind of scrunch and just put it in there. And, and also for your mineral spirits, some people say, oh yeah, I, I've used it for months and months and months. And it starts to smell different. You lose those odorless properties the longer you use it. This is something you don't go dump in your field, you don't um, dump it down the drain. This needs to be treated like car oil, where you take it to a special recycling location. What I have is we've got a self-sealed canister and we're always dumping it in. Some people say, oh, I let, the, I let the sludge settle down at the bottom and I use the top. That's what we used to do years, years ago. It's no longer odorless mineral spirits. It, I can walk into a room and say, okay, who's using their old turp? Because it has a, that distinctive smell that can be a, quite an irritant. So make sure you dispose of that. And we want to caution you on using a container that's made out of glass invariably it falls off the easel, the wind knocks it off, something happens, it gets bumped, and your glass shatters. Now you've got a hazardous spot to try to stand in with the broken glass, and all your paint thinner is gone. So we, we never recommend to our students that they bring any kind of container for their paint thinners in glass. Plastic or metal is definitely the way to go. So then we've got um, our Bug spray and your uh, sunscreen, you always need that. You need your hat, uh, you've got your umbrella if that's gonna work out for you. And so there's certain things that, uh, if you're gonna go to the beach, you're gonna bring some of these, or into the woods, you're gonna bring these. So make sure they, they get in your pack as well. And if it's chillier out, I have a lab coat that I take because it has long sleeves and it's a little bit warmer. It has a couple of pockets in it. As I was talking about earlier when we gave our intro, I take a pair of gloves to keep my hands a little cleaner because oil paint is messy and I tend to get it on me. Then there's things like paper towels. Um, shop towels are a little pricier than like a Viva or another type of paper towel, but I get twice the use out of a shop towel as one of these towels. This will hold a lot more solvent paint combination things and I can fold it in half and use the inside and use the outside while well, I'd be using three to four of these. So initially this may be more expensive, but I get a lot more use out of it. Just make sure that if you are using these quite a bit, you always want to wear a glove on your left hand. Sometimes I don't wear a glove on my right hand, uh, but on my left hand, if I'm handling those solvents and wiping my hand, uh, wiping my brush in my hand, I make sure that I have a glove on that hand. Um, let's talk about how's a, how's a a good way to get these transported once you get back. We mentioned uh, a pizza box, and uh, if it's dry, you can put it in a little folder. But they also make some of these great little boxes with six by eights pasted on or taped on to each of these eight by tens. Use the little six by eights first. They're drying. Now I've got the eight by tens to use. I'm going home with eight paintings. All of them can fit in here. Also, you can buy little. Uh, Cardboard, cardboard ones, and these these put together and do the same thing, different sizes. And these are available also online at different sources. Mm -hmm. Even Amazon carries the ones Maybe like that. This is a gorilla painter. Okay. So a sketchbook. It's a good idea um, to get those thumbnails on. I usually do two per page. I might do a vertical or a horizontal. 
But I always do a thumbnail first. The thumbnail is the place where you do things to see whether you like the way it looks. Check your composition, see if you like the lines and elements that you've put into it. So this is my little sketchbook. I like it to be a spiral one so that I can fold the cover back because I, when I choose one of these to do, this is what I'm putting on the canvas, not looking out at the scene, I'm looking at this because this is what I decided is going to be my painting. So a small sketchbook that will fit in whatever you're putting your things into. And so we'll talk about the helpful visual aids here. All right, so we've got a variety of things to show you here with these visual aids. Um, the little viewfinders, this is just a little paper version of a viewfinder. And it has, it even has marked on, on it the sizes and stuff as you go around. Whether you want a square, or you want a rectangle, or you want one of those longer formats, whether it's vertical or horizontal, these little paper ones are nice. And what we want to do when we go out into nature, we want to paint it off. So this is a tool to keep us focused on what is the focal point, why am I there to paint that beautiful scene, and what do I want to include in the painting. It's overwhelming when you have 360 degrees of beautiful paintings area, and this helps to narrow that down. So here's a plastic version that if you get paint on, like I get paint on lots of things, you can wipe this one off. But you can use it uh, at arm's length to kind of narrow in and zero down on your scene. You can pull back to see if I want to include more elements or something in it. So you can use and make your different sizes. You can use it extended. You can use it pulled up. Lots of different ways to use this. Also, it has a uh you want to isolate colors. This also has a little hole in the center just so that you can say, oh, how dark is that dark? Or is that sky or is that snow really white? Oh no, it's actually blue. So by isolating that color, and you can do that with these, also these little value squares too. That works as well. So this is, this is one off the little palette paper on the inside of the cover on the Richardson palette, they have one on here for you. So you can cut this out and have it ready to take with you. We always punch holes in them so that we can squint and look through it and isolate a color and help us determine how light or dark it is. And we can go over how you use a value scale a little bit when we get into processes and stuff. Um, okay. uh, not many have seen this any longer, uh, slide mounts. But if you run into a whole box of them, buy them. I pass these out to my students. They get one of these, a little color filter, uh, and uh, a little, and one of these where they uh, get to uh, judge the values and um, isolate the color. So these are great, little slide mounts or using your hands. Yeah, so you can actually take and use your hands and narrow in on something very well. I mean, you can make it smaller and you can make it bigger, so your own hands have the ability to be a great little viewfinder if you've got nothing more. Mm -hmm. So those will work as well. This is another type of commercial one, and the thing that's kind of cool about this one is that it has a little value thing on it, the lightest, the medium, and the darkest, but this also has a grid on it, and this grid, where all these lines crosses, are called dynamic points. And those are the points that are the most pleasing in a painting for your center of interest. So this can kind of help, especially a less experienced painter, figure out where that center of interest or their most interesting object should be placed in it. And you choose one. You may have a, a secondary focal point that is, is of less importance, and you could put that on, on a second one. But generally, you only choose one. To put your focal point. What's nice about this one, and I've seen some people use it this way, is they use a white marker board or a, a, a marking pen, and they will hold this up and they will do their composition right on here. This is their sketch, this is their thumbnail. And they've done it by looking at the scene. Okay, my river's here. Uh, maybe I have a high horizon line, maybe I have a low horizon line. So uh, this works well because you can print right on it. This is by EZL artwork essentials. And so those, those would be available at lots of the art supply sites. I haven't looked at Amazon to see if they have anything like this, mm -hmm. but maybe they do. Yeah. Oh. 
So another uh, thing that can be really difficult to determine when you don't have as much experience in the field or you're just not having the best morning with your eyes is to figure out your values in the scene that you're looking at. So an aid to help you with that is a red or maybe a blue or a green film. And when you look through it, it takes away all the color and just leaves the value for you. Now the reds can affect browns a little bit, but I still like to have them in my backpack. It's great to check your painting as you progress to make sure you're keeping your values the way that they should be in the painting. And for looking at something and removing all the color to see how the elements look together. And, and blue does the same. It's a little harder to see through it, but it doesn't um, uh, affect the browns quite as much. This and is, they have, go ahead. No, no. This is another one that you can get. Uh, this one is, is this perfect picture? Oh my God. Perfect, perfect picture, picture perfect. So this has your red film in it, and it also has the grid system on it so you can find out where those dynamic points are and figure out you know, what's one third, two thirds, and all of those while you're looking at your scene. And the cool thing about one like this is you can fold it over and use all of them together. So you've got your grid work and your red is showing through so you can accomplish a couple things at once with this one that folds. Mm -hmm. I know that Amazon carries this and many of the art supply sites carry this as well. And you can make them yourself. I, I went just down to Hobby Lobby and got uh, some little frames and you put them together, or little mats, put them together, a couple bucks each, and get um, some of the red plastic film. And I made a whole bunch of them for my students. So um, you can move, make them yourself. So those, you know, any of these types of things to help you along is terrific. This is a newer product, um, and it kind of looks like a paint chart, you know, like you used to go and, and look for paint colors. But the cool thing about this, and um, this is called Color Matching Guide, is that they have the little squares cut in it. And if you have a hard time determining, say, what color of green, let's say green. So you've got all of these colors you can kind of look through here, and you can just hold it up, and you look through this and you look at your color that you're trying to get the mixture for out there and this will tell you is it this color, this color, this color or which color it is and then it could even be off from this a little bit but this will get you in the right direction. For a lot of people, especially with greens, they're always painting the distant greens as green because their mind says that's a green but in actuality greens in the distance have more of a blue cast to them, so a blue-green cast. And this is a great way to determine how blue or how green a color might be. And sometimes when you're looking at really light colors like a road or something, you're not sure if it's pink or if it's gold or if it's gray. Using some of these on that will help determine what color range a particular object mm -hmm. is in. I ordered this off of Amazon and it's a product that I like and it's a very helpful thing to have for my students out in the field. Sounds great. I kind of feel like we have the table, Julia Child table of <laughs> recipes here. So we're hoping that you can join us for the process and um, stay tuned. We'll put all of these to work. Segment two will be about everything that is involved in your head and your hands and everything else. So hopefully you'll come back and watch how we complete a painting in the next segment.